guys, I just finished an interview with Neil Bauman, the Assistant Director of the Future of Humanity Institute, which was completely fascinating. It's a whole new area for me um, around existential risk and the future of humanity. Just small topics to think about over breakfast. And uh, so I'm going to roll the interview now. I hope you enjoy it and uh, stay tuned for more updates on Solvi and some other stuff. Cheers. <laughs> I love this chair. I love it. Neil, thank you so much for having this chat with me and no problem. sharing a bit with these guys um, <laughs> uh, what you've been up to and what you're doing now. Um, it's such a fascinating journey you've been on, similar ages, a couple of years younger than me. Uh, now I've hit the big 3 0, but um, really interesting parallel paths in a way. And I'd love for you to share a little bit about it and then tell us what you're doing here in this amazing place in Oxford. Yeah, so um, I started out uh, going to university here. Um, the, a few months after I got here, I ran a big campaign on climate change, which fascinated me. We got all of these lights and lights across the university powered by renewable electricity. Amazing. Um, and then I uh, went on to do other things. I was on Obama's energy and environment policy team. Uh, I was uh, set up a small climate policy think tank. Um, I was climate science advisor to, to the president of the Maldives. Um, but then I met a bunch of folk here who... Uh, thought about how to do as much good as possible in ways that I hadn't thought before mm. um, and in ways that I thought I could learn a lot from. Um, so William McCaskill, who's just written a book, um, Doing Good Better, which I mm -hmm. uh, recommend checking out. He, um, he challenged me with this question early on of, uh, what if I took a well-paying, a good-paying job, um, a well-paying job, and uh, used it to fund, say, three people to do the job I was going to be doing in climate policy? No. Um, or paid someone really good uh, three times the salary, surely they could do a better job than me. Mm. Um, I thought, hey, maybe actually they could, which means that I've thought completely the wrong mm. way about how to do as much good as I can in my career and decided to spend a bunch more time here learning from them. Turns out they had fascinating ideas, but mm. they did not know how to run an organization. <laughs> and so um, I had them draw me their, their org chart and it wasn't an org chart. They were sort of like... <laughs> Well, everyone does a bit of everything, you know. <laughs> Spaghetti junction. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and so we created the first org chart, and then I proposed the creation of the Center for Effective Altruism, um, which was a sort of a charity to take a bunch of these ideas on mm. how to do as much good as possible and mm. put them into practice. Yeah. So uh, they now have a series of different projects, um, 80,000 Hours, which uh, offers free careers advice focused on maximizing your social impact, um, giving what we can, which is a community of people giving... 10% uh, of their salary or more mm -hmm. to the most cost-effective charities in the world, and they make fantastic recommendations mm -hmm. of uh, public health charities. Um, then other things, so um, a, a think tank focused on prioritizing global problems and making recommendations to government. Mm -hmm. um, and then all of, out of all of this has grown this movement of uh, effective altruism, basically a movement of people trying to use um, evidence and analysis to figure out how they can maximize the amount of good they can do in the world mm -hmm. and then actually going into the real world and putting it into practice and actually making it happen exactly yeah guys i will link below a talk um, that he's done earlier this year that was really awesome and goes into far more depth about all the stuff that you're talking about in case some of this flying over your head um i i watched it this morning it was brilliant so um check it out in the description below so why don't you tell us a bit about what that's led you on to now i mean i'm walking around here and there's a bunch of clearly very intelligent people walking around with incredible stuff all over the walls. What What is it that you're, what has that led you to? Yeah, so um, after helping set up the Centre for Effective Altruism and uh, working on that for a few years, um, I, um, about half a year moved, uh, a year ago, moved into the Future of Humanity Institute, mm -hmm. which is uh, a research institute within Oxford University, um, which is focused on improving the long run future as much as possible. One of the big ideas that um, the founder of the organization, Professor Nick Bostrom, has been pioneering is this idea of existential risk. Mm -hmm. The idea that uh, as we develop um, more and more powerful technologies, humans are developing for the first time the ability to wipe out everyone on the planet. So we mm. saw that first with nuclear weapons. Um, over the 21st century, there's likely to be a whole bunch of other technologies coming online, um, which might also have this power. Yeah. Um, everything from... Uh, synthetic biology through to artificial intelligence through to uh, molecular scale manufacturing and uh, so the question is how are we going to navigate the development of these technologies to ensure that um, they are beneficial and we create a 
big and glorious future for humanity rather than wiping ourselves out? So that's a question that we think about here. So just, you know, your average daily kind of ponderings over your breakfast, that kind of thing. <laughs> I first watched Nick's Google Talk um, about a month ago uh, after a friend connected me to the talk and it really blew my mind and he's really incredibly articulate at some stuff I've never even heard people try to engage with before. I'll also link that link in the description below so you guys can see that if, if you can hack it. It's about an hour and a bit long, It's but it's brilliant. Um, but he is, he is doing some fantastic work and you've come here a year ago to join him. And so what is it that you're personally passionate about? What is it that you hope to achieve being here, coming from that effective altruism kind of world into this space? What's next for you? Yeah, so um, ultimately the, the big question, the big challenge that we're focused on is uh, what happens to artificial intelligence and the development of it as it approaches human level? So um, we're creating AIs that are smarter and smarter. We're still way off. This is unlikely to happen for a few decades at least, but it's probably, uh, it wouldn't surprise me if it happened this century. It wouldn't surprise me if we got human level artificial intelligence during my lifetime. Mm -hmm. um, now the challenge here arises when humans, uh, sorry, when, when artificial intelligence is able to essentially do everything that humans do, mm -hmm. including designing artificial intelligence. Yes. The scenario that worries me is one where you get self-improving artificial intelligence, which makes itself smarter. Once mm -hmm. it can do programming and code AIs yeah. as well as a human can, um, it basically starts self-improving. And uh, then you can end up with uh, uh, algorithms and intelligences that are far more intelligent mm -hmm. than humans. Um, and when this happens, uh, what are they going to be optimizing the world for? Mm -hmm. um, what is it that they're gonna be creating? Mm -hmm. um, now, uh, hopefully, we program them well, and uh, they're optimizing for a, uh, for a great flourishing uh, human civilization society, um, or perhaps something else. But um, there are also scenarios in which we program them badly, mm. and um, they misunderstand our aims, and uh, they optimize for something else entirely. And so um, the, the sort of analogy that's sometimes used, humans do not dominate the planet because we were the fastest Mm. or because we were the strongest, mm -hmm. um, but rather because we were the smartest. Yeah. And so once you create another intelligence that's smarter than us, um, the worry is that we may go the way of the gorillas. Mm -hmm. The gorillas, it's not like uh, we don't like the gorillas. It's mm -hmm. not like we think that they're evil in some way. It's simply that we have other uses for their resources. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're driving them further and further towards extinction. Mm -hmm. um, and so we need to find a way to ensure that AI is programmed in such a way that it ensures our best, it keeps our best interests at mm, home. Mm. I, uh, I often think about the analogy, the difference between pigs and dogs. I'm led to believe, whether it's true or not, that they have similar levels of intelligence. And I always think, when I think about the sort of maybe being further down the food chain, or not being in control in the way that we've been, there's been this overriding paradigm of control for humans in the world that we've lived in. but. You know, when that paradigm is broken and we're no longer in control, I'm thinking I'd much rather be a dog than I would a pig. <laughs> Pigs have had a bit of a hard rap. Do you know what I mean? That we like the way they taste. We stick them out in the mud. Whereas dogs, we've taken to quite fondly and we kind of love them and care for them. And uh, I'd, I'd rather find myself in the situation of being a dog than a pig. Does that make any sense? I, yeah, I can, I can see the analogy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I never thought of it like that. <laughs> it seems to me as we deal with these bigger and bigger questions, you can't help but getting into the realms of philosophy and potentially spirituality or not. And I'm interested to know what your beliefs are about existence at its, at its core, because really the definition of what being human is, I guess, really comes from how you believe we came about and what kind of order there is that, that pulls all of this matter together. So I'm interested to know what kind of thinking permeates yeah. your life in this office. Yeah, so um, I, I, there's, a, there's a range of views in the office, mm. but I think my views are uh, somewhere around the median um, on, on a bunch of issues. Mm. I think there's probably not uh, a god up there that's sort of somehow directing proceedings yeah. here, but um, I do think that we have a great opportunity to do good in this lifetime and uh, that to, to improve the lives of others and that we're quite unique and fortunate to have been born in a time when such great change is happening in society. Mm. 
and in which we have such opportunity to uh, to influence the world mm. and the trajectory of civilization, potentially for thousands of years in the future, just by the decisions that we make over the coming century. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned, sort of this is the first century, uh, sort of from the 60s onwards, when we've really been able to wipe ourselves out. Mm. That could have dramatic consequences going forwards. Mm. And so um, the the thinker James Martin, he starts his, his book, um, uh, his most recent book, uh, with this question of when, if you could be born any time in history, when yeah. would you want to be born? And um, he says that uh, if he could have any choice, he'd want to be a teenager now uh -huh. in a country with great access to both education and technology, um, uh, basically where he could receive a first class education and go on to shape the world. And um, so I think it's it's really fortunate that uh, that I happen to have been born sort of at that time. And, and I imagine many of you will also be mm. in a similar situation. Absolutely. Um, and sort of have this vast potential to, mm. to influence and improve the world out there with an aim to maximize the amount of good you can do while avoiding violating any rights. This seems to me like a, uh, like a really useful framework is mm. go and create the biggest possible difference you can in the world, but mm. don't, don't harm anyone along the way. Well, I'll put the links below, like I said. Thank you so much for talking with me. No problem. Thanks and for having me on the show. Yeah, my pleasure. And uh, I'm sure plenty more crossover will happen in the future. So watch this space, guys. Also, some announcements coming soon for the Solvi project. So keep tuned for that. It's going to be very exciting this year. And uh, yeah, see you soon.